Thank you, Martha. It's an honor to be here today and to be invited to share a few of my thoughts to this truly remarkable crowd. So as Groucho Marx famously said in 1949 at the end of the Great Depression, and as Woody Allen later quoted in the movie Annie Hall, I wouldn't want to belong to any club that would accept me as a member. Well, obviously neither Groucho, Groucho nor Woody were ever invited to participate in the TIP Grand Recognition Ceremony. As I'm sure, sure you all know, each winter about 75,000 academically talented seventh graders are nominated by their schools to take part in the Duke TIP seventh grade talent search, and as Mar Martha explained the criteria, to take the SAT or ACT to learn more about their abilities. Well, what you might not know is there are almost four million seventh grade students in the United States. So even just being nominated to take part is a tremendous achievement. But you've gotten on to achieve even more. Those of you sitting in this stadium here today are among the very highest scoring students, the top 4% or so of all of those who accepted the talent search challenge. So the, we are thus gathered here today for a day of celebration to applaud your outstanding performance and the promise that it heralds of where you might go from here. So as Duke's provost, I want to extend a warm and hearty welcome to you, the very newest TIP honorees. And I want to take a moment to tip my hat to your parents, your friends, your families, your teachers, your mentors, all of whom may or may not be here today, but who played a part in shaping the person you've so far become. You're a remarkable group of students and you are in the excellent company of many other tipsters who have gone before you. You're joining the ranks of many who went on to achieve great things. Accomplished Duke TIP alum includes professors, authors, doctors, scientists, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and more. This year's Distinguished Alumni Awards, as you know, honor TIP alum who are leaders in economics, in education, in medicine, in information management, and in journalism. And other past alumni are equally impressive. Alice Chen Plotkin, a TIP alum from the late 1980s, visited us here in Durham last year. While here, she mused about her middle school years and shared about how she remembered feeling this immense urge to belong, but also to be the person she was. The community and the camaraderie she found in her fellow TIP talent search winners was hugely helpful in her finding the person she was on the inside and having it match the person she was on the outside. Alice, Alice went on to become a Rhodes Scholar. She is now a neuroscientist and neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania, where she runs a research group studying neurodegeneration and Parkinson's. Other distinguished TIP alums include Jeff Davis, a data scientist at Google, Kimberly Garbett, a US Air Force major and international programs manager with the Partnership for Peace Consortium. New York Times best-selling author of The Fault in Our Stars, John Green, probably some of you have read his books, Franklin Leonard, founder and CEO of The Blacklist and advisor to Boom Gen Studios and Plimpton, and many, many more. Interestingly, another TIP alumna, Shauna Young, will soon be returning to Duke from MIT to become our next TIP executive director, aiming to fill the very, very large shoes that are relentlessly encouraging and awesome Martha Batalis will be leaving behind. Shauna credits her own seventh grade talent search experience with motivating her to aspire to higher levels of success than she had previously thought possible. To have the chance to help provide similar opportunities to thousands more gifted students, she says, is both inspiring and humbling. So this all raises an interesting and powerful point. So if you look to your left and you look to your right, these are the students that you will run into many times later in your life. That may sound kind of funny, but it is the group you will see in the top universities. This group you will meet if you go to a debate tournament, or an a cappella competition, or a chess championship, or an improv comedy group showdown. You folks are talented, and you will see each other going through life. In, men, in case any of you are still wondering, why exactly have so many noteworthy individuals going back to 1981 elected to participate in the talent search? Well, aside from the opportunity to demonstrate your talents, and let's face it, you pretty much get that opportunity all the time at school and in your extracurricular activities, qualifying through the seventh grade talent search opens the doors to you for one of Duke's renowned summer programs. And I quote from the TIP website, 
dedicated to supporting and extending local efforts to better understand, motivate, enrich, and academically challenge the brightest students in our nation. TIP offers intensive and demanding three-week sessions on U.S. college campuses for grades 7 to 8 and for 9 to 10 and popular e-studies program that offers challenging coursework and connects gifted students worldwide using state-of-the-art internet-based technology. So this is really a big deal and you've done incredibly well and a whole world of opportunity opens to you. And I, along with every single person here, enthousi enthusiastically applaud you for this achievement. But what I'd like to think about today is how you continue to carry this to torch of excellence forward as you move through the rest of your education, on through college and beyond. I'm guessing that many of you, if not all, pretty much being, enjoy being good at academics. But is it possible that your desire to achieve excellence might act actually be an impediment to exploring new things? And what if your passions in life or those things at which you hope to excel do not come naturally to you. So although I've been at Duke for more than 20 years now, I'm still relatively new as Duke's provost, also known as the chief academic officer, which means that schools like arts and sciences, law, business, environment, et cetera, report to me. So as provost, I've been given the opportunity to experience Duke anew in a way that's not really that different from how you all will experience each new year as you move further and further through your education. So I came to the provost job from the medical school, and new medical students have to take in vast amounts of information with little real choice in their subject matter. For instance, nobody would really want a doctor who decided they didn't need to take any classes, for instance, on the liver or the kidney. I mean, they pretty much have to do what they have to do. But there is a vast menu of curricular, co-curricular, extracurricular offerings that will face you as you move through your undergraduate career, and I found as provost here at Duke, where they're also offered a dizzying array of possibilities, that they have a huge number of choices. So you're now at a point in your education where all of the world is open to you, and if you decide to take part in the TIP program, you'll get a hint of what I'm talking about. So TIP students have the opportunity to explore things like the concept of time and time travel in science fiction writing, cryptography and code breaking and the mathematical theories behind such spy tools, complex system safe, safety analysis through a look at catastrophic disasters in engineering such as the Titanic, the Challenger space shuttle, and the Fukushima meltdown, the biology of ocean habitats through hands-on field work at Duke's Marine Lab, social activism and the politics of power, 3D printing, robotics, collaborative video game programming, and much more. But let me ask you all to think for a moment about whether you might sometimes be hesitant to take classes or enter summer programs or even do things just for fun if you aren't sure that you'll be any good at them. Is it possible that the desire to achieve excellence in all you do might someday cause you to shy away from things that you think are just a little too risky? Well, today I'm going to urge you to take a little risk. Try things that you might not be good at, at least not immediately, or at least not without effort. You know, I like to say I wouldn't start with, you know, skydiving, fire eating, etc. But I do encourage you to be adventurous in your intellectual pursuits. And try to have intellectual pursuits. Take it from me. No matter how intellectually curious you are, it is easy to get swept up in daily concerns and not pursue those interests. I encourage you to try to use your great early achievements as a launching point to delve deeply into areas that look like they might be interesting. Of course, you might not have time for such deep dives during the academic year, where things like summer programs come into play. So looking ahead, if you're exposed to all these wonderful things, you find something about which you are really passionate and you want to make it maybe eventually your life's work, but what if it doesn't come naturally to you? I'm sure that you've all had to work very hard so far in your education. But what if your passions and your talents don't really align and you really have to work hard for a long time to be successful in your chosen area? So when I started college, I knew I was interested in politics. So as Martha said, I became a political science major. But then I stumbled into some biology courses almost by mistake. And I loved all those science classes, the reading, the labs, the discussions. But you know, unlike political science, 
It just didn't come naturally to me. I really had to work if I wanted to achieve the level of excellence that would allow me to continue on to a career in science, which is what I ultimately decided I wanted to do. And then, when I jumped over all the hurdles necessary to become a scientist with a faculty position at Duke, I found out, somewhat to my chagrin, that there was yet another major hurdle, or rather a series of hurdles that were so high, in fact, I've fallen over them many times. It turns out that you have to write grant proposals to the government to get money for your work if you're going to survive as a scientist. And I'm a truly miserable grant writer in all senses of the word miserable. In fact, I have to digress for a moment to read you my favorite quotes on the subject from a scientist who actually is a friend of mine, but he writes under the pseudonym of The Mole in the Journal of Cell Science. The Mole said, quote, if I had the chance to get funding by eating raw insects or traversing badly constructed rope bridges over raging waterfalls, I'd do it in a flash. But grant writing is like bleeding onto the page for days and days. I can't begin to tell you how accurate that description is for me. So here's another. Quote, understand the grant writer is like a wild animal with an injury. You may want to help, but it's more likely that you will lose a finger than they will help thank you for it. Now, obviously, I've never attacked anyone uh, while suffering through a grant proposal, but I absolutely agree with the point. And finally, my favorite quote from him, Writing grants is just about the worst thing a scientist has to do, and I'm including those scientists who pump squid stomachs to find out what they eat. Now, if that last quote sounds benign to you, know that squids are carnivores, some are even cannibals, and one expert describes their innards as digestive goo, so that's probably a good comparison. In any event, I have sustained a career as a scientist, maybe putting in a little more work than those to whom it comes naturally, definitely by calling on friends to discuss ideas, and most definitely, by asking colleagues to brutally critique my work. And it's all been worth it, even the grant writing, for the thrill of scientific discovery that drew me to this in the first place. So if you find an intellectual passion and you want to pursue it, don't shy away if the path to excellence is not immediately obvious or it presents hurdles, because you can find the path, and successfully navigating these hurdles is well worth it. So how does this all relate to where I started? Why is it so great to have risen to this level of achievement in the TIP talent search? Why would you want to be a member of this club? Well, as a TIP qualifier in my very own family once said, you know, whenever I put my foot in my mouth or I'm feeling less than brilliant, I can always think, hey, I qualified for the TIP Grand Challenge. So you guys can all think that too. Now, that's obviously a bit of a facetious answer, but there is a much deeper and authentic answer. Your truly great performance here should make you think of the great opportunities, both inside and outside of the classroom, that will be open to you. This initial demonstration of talent within a huge national pool should provide you with the confidence to try new things outside of your comfort zone and to follow your passions, even if the path ahead is difficult. You should always be proud to say you're a member of this club. And I could not be more proud to stand in front of you today and to be part of celebrating each and every one of you. My sincere and heartfelt congratulations, and I look forward to seeing where you all go from here. So congratulations. <laughs>